right, elected members, councillors, community board members, we're going to kick it off. If everyone's all, you're all okay there, Grayson, if you want to go live with live streaming. Well, good morning, everybody, and I'd like to welcome you to the Strategy and Operations Committee meeting for the 5th of November. Just moving through to the council blessing, and if someone would like to, I'm happy to, but if someone would like to read Bernie, Bernie's putting his hand up if you'd like to read the council blessing. As we deliberate on the issues before us, we trust that we will reflect positively on the communities we serve. Let us all seek to be effective and just, so that with courage, vision and energy, we provide positive leadership in a spirit of harmony and compassion. Thank you, Councillor Randall. So move on to item number three of the agenda, apologies. I have apologies from Councillor Holborough and noting uh, Marilyn Stevens from the Autaki Community Board is also not available today. Um, and we also have uh, Councillor Gwyn Compton who is attending via uh, remote Zoom. So that's not recorded as an apology, is it, Grace? And it's, yeah. But just noting that Gwyn is present, he's just not um, here with us. So if we've got someone that can move those apologies for the three. Um, moved by His Worship the Mayor, seconded by Councillor Henford. Any further discussion? All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Item number four of the agenda is declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda. A quick scan around the room. I don't see any hands going up. None have been made aware to me. So we'll move on to item number five, public speaking time. And again, I've checked with staff and there is no one in today for public speaking. So item number six, members' business. No responses. Any leave of absence from elected members? Councillor Buswell. Can I please have leave of absence from um, the 27th of November through to the 2nd of December? 27th of November through to the 2nd of December. Anyone else? No? Would someone like to move that leave of absence? Councillor Pravanov and Councillor Randall seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Uh, any matters of an urgent nature? None being made aware of to me. Not too sure if the Chief Executive wants to give us a rundown of the uh, US uh, elections. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> um, I think we've got weeks or months before, so maybe it's not an urgent nature. <laughs> Mr Chair, thank you. Scarily, that is possibly true. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we move on to um, updates, which there is none, and quickly through to reports. So the first that we have there, actually, I'm just going to double check with um, the team because we were going to do a little bit of a reshuffle. Um, and I think the this one's okay. All right. So we're moving on to page number six of the uh, report, and that is item number eight point one the Local Government Funding Agency Statement of Intent. So I think we have Mark de Haast remotely, is that correct? Not yet. Not yet. We need to sort that out, so we may move to another agenda item if we need to. Yeah, Do you want to move on to a... Yeah, sure. All right, team, so we, look, we obviously have the agenda order in the paper. The Chair can move that order around. I had intended to move the agenda order around to place the paper which had the considerations for the Chief Executive appointment um, to the end so that uh, to be appropriate the Chief Executive would leave the table and not be involved in the discussion. Uh, at the end of the meeting uh, Wayne would then be able to just leave and then continue on with the mountain of other work he has to do rather than just mill around in the, uh, in the corridor. Um, and so I did intend to do that, and given that we don't have Mark here, we're going to move to the, um, let's flick back up to the, the agenda item 8.4, which is the decision on the proposed district plan variation. So Jason, if you and your team can come up now, we're going to move to page 139, which is the fourth report on the agenda 8.4.
All right, good morning, gentlemen. You're going to walk us through this, so I'm just going to hand it over to you, and if you can take the elected members through, I know there's going to be a few questions, and um, see how we go. Tēnā koe, councillor, and, and tēnā koutou, um, councillors and elected members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about Variation 2 uh, to the proposed district plan. Um, this is actually the last of the variations that have been made to the proposed district plan that are still in process. Uh, earlier, uh, not that long ago actually, um, variations 3 and 4 were completed and variation 1 uh, quite some time ago was completed. So, so this is the last sort of uh, piece in the puzzle if you like. Um, before we can start thinking about coming back to you and making the proposed district plan fully operative and what a day for the district that will be. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about variation two. So um, where is it in the process and a little bit about uh, the background. Variation two, as you will have read in, in your paper, follows a community process that occurred I think in about 2017 uh, with, the, with the local Waikanae Beach community. And um, in that process, the community expressed a, a desire for a greater protection for the, the character that they valued uh, about that Waikanae Beach uh, area. And, and so one of the responses to that uh, process was Variation 2 and the amendments that uh, have, have been progressed through that process to better protect the, the character of that area. Uh, so uh, we have uh, some time ago now uh, gone through uh, both an informal consultation process um, and also what the RMA requires that we do which is the formal process so uh, the public has had an opportunity to, to place submissions uh, following a public notification and as you uh, will have read there there was a hearing of those submitters who wished to be heard and that was completed in, in August um, so what you have before you now is the report from that hearings panel uh, and comprised of independent chair, uh, very experienced uh, Robert Schofield, uh, your, your very own councillor Holborough and uh, Maria Pomeroy who is a expert commissioner in matters tikanga Māori and so they considered submissions and uh, of course the higher order documents that, that come into play and have delivered you with some recommendations and the choice for you today is, is a relatively simple one. It's either to accept those recommendations as, as your own, uh, in which case we would then proceed to uh, publicly notify that decision and that would begin a 30 day period, uh, 30 working day period for appeals. Apologies for that. Um, mm, there must be a jar of water I should put that in. Um, so that's, that's one choice that you have before you today and, and to be honest that's the traditional choice um, that reflects that uh, all of the work that's been done to date, uh, it, it gives it the opportunity to go through the next stage. Um, your other options are essentially to, to not accept the uh, hearing panel's recommendations that would require a rehearing and essentially going back to uh, stage one and, and of course the, the issues with that would be um, that all of the resources that have been put into this process to date um, uh, arguably would be wasted. Uh, another option would be to withdraw the variation and uh, we don't recommend that that option be pursued either. We don't see any uh, reason why council would want to do that. So that's in a nutshell um, well, a bit about the background, a bit about the, the process. Uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of detail in before you in terms of the report and, and the various attachments about the actual content of Variation 2 and what it does. Happy to take questions and of course let me introduce uh, my colleague here, Mr Matt Muspratt, he's the Principal uh, Policy Planner who has been in charge essentially of, of Council's um, advice to the hearings panel 
uh, on variation two. So uh, both Matt and I are happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks, Jason and Matt. And um, look, for a number of new councillors around the table, it's a good opportunity for you to ask questions. If you don't understand the process, we've heard from Jason in terms of uh, the process to date. We have some recommendations there, and I uh, don't want to let the members to take those lightly. Um, as Jason has said, the, typically um, councils. Um, uh, past experience has been to accept those recommendations. You have the option to not, but that does trigger um, other things. So uh, I guess the first question from me was if the council decided not to accept the recommendations and, for example, to have a uh, rehearing, what would be the costs, approximate costs of doing all that process over again? In a sense, that would take us all the way back to um, re-establishing the policy intent um, so if you really wanted to do that uh, properly, that would take you back to consulting with the community and, and the costs associated with, with that, both in terms of staff time and, and uh, any expert assistance that we needed. Um, then of course it would be re-preparing the uh, variation itself and the Section 32 justification that went with that, again with any expert input that we needed. Uh, we would then need to, uh, I guess, recommission an independent hearings panel following public notification and, and submissions. Um, yeah, I mean, the approximate ballpark sort of costs you're talking about there are probably somewhere in uh, excluding staff time, I would imagine, somewhere between the fifty to $100,000. So that's about what I thought. Um, I know that um, there are some questions from elected members around the impact of the um, national policy statement around urban development. Um, and how that uh, works alongside or overrides um, this if it was approved. Councillor McCann, did you want to open that out any further? I know that you and I have discussed this with your role around housing. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think just to reiterate your point, how does this fit within the national policy uh, directives from the government, given that they have come out after this process began? And then I've got a few follow-ups from there. Sure. So that was a matter that the hearings panel did consider. Uh, they were presented with some information about that, um, both from um, our council officer, uh, but also um, submitters had, a, had their own views about that. Um, it did present a challenge. So the former version of that NPS was the, if you like, the live version uh, from inception of this variation through submissions all the way uh, through further submissions, passed all the way up to actually um, uh, right, right before the hearing started, and then it actually took effect um, shortly after. I think it closed, didn't it? Yeah. So it was. Yeah, that's right. So it was it was an interesting process, and so we um, certainly through our council officer. Um, attempted to provide some advice to the hearings panel about that. Um, in the end, the hearings panel, and, and it's reflected in their report, um, that they gave it uh, appropriate consideration. They also um, noted that it's, it's a, a tough ask for council to have been able to give it uh, full effect when uh, with that timing issue. And, and I think really uh, for council ultimately, the MPS urban development is still a live consideration for that area, just like it is for urban environments throughout the district. Variation two, I don't believe, absolves that area from us needing to, to look at it in the, in the light of uh, the MPS urban development. So what you're effectively saying there is if, if we pass this variation, um, it is likely we're going to have to revisit the the issue because this variation, I may be putting words into your mouth now, this variation um, has the potential to, to not give um, the, the, the desired effect, which is to create more housing. If I could just jump in there to, I guess, add some context to that. Could you argue, though, that that would be the same anywhere across the district with all aspects of the district plan, not just Waikanae Beach? Yes, you, you certainly could argue that. I mean, the I guess when we look at that particular area, and this is the advice that the hearings panel received, uh, 
th this isn't likely to be within what you might think of as a walkable catchment of a uh, rapid transit stop, which might be Waikanae railway station, for instance. Uh, it's not likely to be within a walkable catchment of a what we're likely to call a metropolitan centre, which in Kapiti is likely to be Parapara Umu. Um, so it falls into the category, and this is, I think was the, the advice that we gave, um, of being one of those other urban environments. It's not subject to uh, expectations of six storeys or anything like that. It, it requires more work to be done to understand uh, what uh, densities might be necessary. That work hasn't been uh, fully done. But we also need to remember that the, the MPS urban development, um, it, it also provides for things like qualifying matters, um, whereby in an urban environment there may be reasons for densities to perhaps not be uh, as dense uh, as they otherwise could be. And so more work needs to be done, I guess, is, is the long story short, to, to figure out what the full impact of the MPSUD might be in that area. Uh, we just haven't done uh, that work yet. When um, you look at the Um, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. When we, if this is passed, when we uh, promote this, will we make sure <coughs> that we do send the signals that this process started before perhaps the new directives and that there is still more work in this area to go because otherwise it could send a signal and we're all aware of one of the challenges with housing is everyone doesn't want new development in their own backyard and it could start that chain reaction where everyone rushes to council to go, well, we've got to make sure that we don't have any building next to us. Uh, has that been considered and would that be considered as part of the narrative um, that we need to ensure our community knows? <coughs> yeah, it, it, it sounds good balancing it. Um, I mean, one of the key messages, of course, is going to be here is council actively responding to a community process um, and, and taking steps to recognise what that local community values. And, and that's still a part of district planning. Um, the MPSUD doesn't, doesn't change that completely. Uh, but certainly a, a theme of our our communications about this, perhaps through the growth strategy conversations, has to be that uh, we are a classifies a tier one urban environment that does include all urban environments, um, with a particular focus on those walkable catchments I've mentioned. But it actually also does include other types of urban environments, um, and, and they are, they all need to have a, a degree of consideration put as to whether they're. Uh, heights and densities are appropriate. Um, so yeah, I guess my answer is yes, amongst other messages. Mm. And my final question is, because this is a large organisation, we don't always see what goes on inside, was the team that's involved in this also speaking to the, the new housing, effective, effectively the new housing development team and people who are looking at the how uh, the solution to housing issues, was there any connect within council um, and sharing of information? Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure which team you're Janice's going. team, for instance. Right, okay. Um, so, what I can say there is that, that there is reference in uh, particularly the officer's report, and, and it was reflected in the council's report, uh, sorry, the hearing panel's report, uh, about the housing and business assessment. And, and that um, reflection, I guess, points out that this particular area hasn't really been considered one of those, if you like, hotspots. Um, there are other areas where the, the demand has, there's certainly proof of the demand being higher, um, that are, are perhaps a little bit more connected uh, to, to key services, a little bit closer to uh, things like the district centre. Um, 
which are probably more likely to be a priority for some of the initiatives led by that team. It, it. Um, yeah, so, so whilst there are two different things that are going on here, um, uh, Jason is part of uh, the team who are involved in our growth response alongside Hamish who has had the lead um, and his team does in the HBA um, and um, the housing people who have been all attending the regional growth framework work and that's really more the answer to your question about are we considering where the right places are for housing growth. The HBA does consider where um, infill practically is likely to happen at a, at a um, district wide level and, and, and looks at those formulas. So I guess the answer is that, that Jason and the team are absolutely uh, involved together through that. It doesn't directly link to this piece of work, but that doesn't mean they're not aware of how they, they join together. Thank you. And to, to just finish on, on one question related to what the CEO just said, are you confident that this variation won't affect the opportunity for infill which is obviously not driven by government, but is driven by uh, often land prices. And, and we know that that is one of the many solutions for trying to increase the housing stock. Are you confident that this variation won't affect uh, the ability for that to occur? There is still a process that people can go through, uh, a, a consenting process to achieve infill, but it is important to realise the purpose of this variation. It's, it's intended to um, reflect the, the local community's wishes for a, a community that, that continues to have the character uh, that it has now, and that uh, has been subject to some expert work, um, and, it, and it does certainly uh, look at things like uh, how much building bulk uh, and density uh, can you have in that area whilst maintaining that kind of character. So uh, it's, it's certainly not trying to encourage anything that would, uh, would change that character significantly. Um, and in that sense, if anything, it probably is tilting the table a little bit away from uh, heights and, and densities increasing in that area in order to provide for that local community's wishes. Um, but there is still a consenting process that is available to people in the event that they wanted to uh, proceed with an infill development. So if I can have one further question. So the answer to that question is, if I'm hearing it right, that this does tilt the process away from uh, infill occurring in this particular area because the community doesn't want it, that community as opposed to the wider community of capital? It's, it's certainly noting the connection between uh, character and uh, the, the density or, or bulk uh, or appearance of, of housing, fencing, uh, entranceway, width, that, that kind of thing, um, it, it's certainly drawing that connection. So the answer is yes, it does tilt. I'm happy to give you a yes. I'm happy to give you a yes from my perspective and just remind you that um, Jason's put it quite diplomatically, we actually agree that that isn't the right place for medium or higher density. So, so whilst there's a balancing act in there, people should and can look at infill should they wish to, um, and there is a process. Um, all the best practice stuff that the entire region's working on says intensify in the right places, the walkable communities. Um, and so, so at the highest possible level when we review this overall, I still think we'd come up with an answer that says um, we're not upset about the way this balance is sitting. Did you want to say anything, Natasha? You're looking, no, you're okay? So I hope that makes sense that it isn't, it isn't where we would be looking to say we want a whole lot more intensification either. So, so what the community wants isn't at odds with what we ultimately are trying to achieve. So hopefully we win-win.
Councillor, I'm going to move to others, and if you have something that comes up, given the topic, I will come back at the end and wrap up. And also just noting, and it's a remi reminder for myself, I have said to Councillor Compton as well that I'll check in with him at the end of questions at each topic and just see whether um, Councillor Compton has any, um, so that he has an opportunity. Um, Your Worship, the Mayor, you're up next, and then Councillor Pravanov. Yeah, um, just following on the same topic. Um, this is where the rubber hits the road in the sense of local democracy and local communities wanting to shape the places where they live. Um, I see in paragraph five, you, the name is Our Future Waikanae Beach Community Vision and Action Plan for Waikanae Beach 2017. Am I correct in saying that this document is actually part and parcel of what we have always termed the Local Outcomes Plan? Because local outcomes plan have got a specific position in the district plan. My understanding is, is it is one of the local, local outcomes documents that was endorsed by the community board <coughs> and noted and acknowledged by the council at its meeting. So it was the local outcomes process that was run by the um, strategy and partnerships team in 2017. Yeah, so it is. Yes, that's my And so it will be. Uh, so and local outcomes plans have got a special. Uh, place in the district plan in terms of the weight that is given in any consent, consenting process. Mm, I'm not. I'm not 100% certain that it is a local outcomes plan um, because it's not. It's not um, approved by the council, but it's come. It's gone through that community consultation process. It's been endorsed by the community board. So I'm not 100% certain on if it's one of those documents, but it has been considered as another relevant document. Um, in the assessment under so has this has this document any powers under or um, given weight in the district plan? Your Worship, I'm just going to go to Natasha because I can see that she's jumping up and down to chip in here. So Natasha, thank you. I just wanted to um, to add to that that this um, this document is much newer than the um, previous suite of community outcomes documents that were done under the L when when, it used, when the long term plans used to be LTCCPs. So it's not one of those suites, it's something that has been done much more recently with the community and it's worth bearing that in mind. I, I'm still not clear, I mean, is this document, has it got weight in the district plan or not? That's what variation to it gives it. Right. So um, local outcome plans, you've got, you know, for Pakagriki, you've got one, Rikurangi has got one, um, Tihoro has got one, uh, and I know the other one is called uh, the Tim Timona Road, Garden precinct. Uh, they've got weight in the dis in the district plan in terms of when a resource consent application is made. Uh, people can use those uh, definitions to contest uh, or not uh, consent applications. Uh, have I got that? Only, in, only to a very limited way. So in making resource consent conditions, there is the ability to consider, you have to consider all your statutory documents, and then there's, there's an ability to cover, um, consider other matters, and those sorts of documents would be considered an other matter, and the amount of weight that they were given would depend on things like their, their, their age, and, and, and you know, the fact that some of them are really quite old would be taken into account in terms of how much weight you gave them. As a I, I just want to come back to the point that Rob McCann has made, Council McCann has made in Chief Executive's response, um, that given the NPS and the power that's centralised de uh, development and housing, that local communities have already got a series of platforms in terms of how they've shaped their view of how the community should be. And if that's, um, if that's questionable in the future, uh, how, will this, how will this be uh, incorporated into the growth strategy? I mean, in terms of the shape of the communities and the communities have already expressed opinions. And I know the Tihoro one is up for question. Uh, so I'm just alerting the fact that we don't want to lose the fact that local communities need a place to shape where they live. Thank you. I think that last bit was more of a statement than a comment. So I'm just going to move on to Councillor... Pr uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on to Councillor Pravanov um, and then we have um, Councillor Buswell after that. Thank you, Mr Chair. So as the Waikanae Ward Councillor and as previously the Waikanae Community Board Chair, I was actually part of the Waikanae Beach Community Consultation that developed this document. And um, 
that document was facilitated, I suppose that whole process was facilitated by council staff. And so as a result of um, the outcome of that were, there were about, I think, 26 recommendations. And one of those recommendations was this plan change. And this plan change was basically to align Waikanae Beach with a number of other beach areas of special character, like Otaki Beach, Raumati, Pika Pika. So what's being pr um, proposed here is no different to what is actually uh, has already occurred in other places. So my question, question. is, Thank you. in relation to um, infilling and um, changing things, the same type of process would apply to this area as it would to those other areas of special character. Are you asking about what would the actual steps to go through be not, from a consenting? Not, not necessarily the steps, but just saying that basically if, so obviously there's, there's the same type of thing that's been put in place in Waikanae Beach is already set up for these other areas. So, yeah. um, so Councillor McCann has, um, he's um, correctly asking about info on the potential of that happening here um, and the process um, right. th that would occur there. So the same type yeah. of process would be would also be needed to go for those other areas that also already have that special character yeah. uh, designation? Yes, that's right. Okay. And I'm no expert on it, but I sort of whispered to Jason before, it, any application would go through, you know, there is a process. So whether it's in Paikakariki, Raumati, Viki mm -hmm. Uh, Otaki, Tohoro, um, same process, just the different documents that sit behind that. Um, I, I saw the sitting, I didn't know whether that was to, you know, it's like a new mechanism to throw up people if they're not <laughs> towing the line or um, asking questions, but thank you for the question. Did you have, I imagine you might have had more? Oh, sorry. Well, it's, I can't control it. So, um, so um, what percentage of Waikanae Beach is actually taken up by the spirit uh, by this plan change, please? Don't know the percentage. <laughs> Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, don't know the percentage, but it's about about 430 properties. But so I, I don't have the percentages at, at hand. I think it's probably it's less than a quarter, way less than a quarter. I would. Um, All right. Did you have a um, further question? Okay. Um, I have Councillor Buswell up next. Funny, my question was exactly that. How, how many properties are we talking and how much land, side, land size are we talking in comparison to the whole district that we're kind of talking about in, you know, in the context of our housing and land availability and stuff? I think it's a very small parcel. I just had a quick look and it's like it's described as um, a Old Beach settlement is stretching approximately 3.5 kilometres along the beach, and then it's behind there. But you've already answered it by 400 and something sections. Yeah. So I've got no further names up on the screen, so I'm just going to double check around the table, and then I'm going to just check and see whether Councillor Compton's got any questions. Councillor Elliott. Um, thank you. I've just got a question with regards to paragraph 35 on 143. It describes um, the variation proposes to require at least 50% visual permeability. And then across the page, it talks about 38A privacy screening can be achieved by planting as noted by planting, as noted in the character study. Under the, uh, the, the, the times that a resident would like to make use of character planting of planting along their boundary, or use products for visual that allow visual permeability. Is there then a series of style guides or restrictions or conditions that that person would have to comply to? As far as materials for visual permeability and as far as uh, leaving adequate space for growth for planting. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's not a style guide. It's we've left. It's, it leaves the door quite open in terms of um, how that's achieved. Um, I think the important thing is that it is measurable. It is it's like the visual permeability is something that is measurable by the uh, compliance team. So how how it's achieved is, is up to property owners. Um, so there's a whole range of different materials or styles or designs they they could use. And I did have a look. 
um, on the internet um, before the hearing to see what was available. And there is some some really um, yeah, there's a, there's a wide range of, of options. Okay, Eva, welcome to the Just in here, so planting goes. Um, what considerations are there uh, for setback when people are considering different uh, species? Let's talk macrocarpa <laughs> species. Uh, the, yeah, the district plan doesn't um, doesn't address setbacks in, in residential areas of vegetation. Yeah, so if there are issues associated with um, macro carpentry blocking neighbours' views, which which happens a lot, they fall under. I believe it's the, I think the Property Law Act is a civil issue. So the, the district plan doesn't get involved in um, what people plant in urban areas. So I think the answer is that um, there are other rules, laws or acts that cover the issue that you're raising, but it's a good point. Thanks Councillor Elliott. So no further questions and Councillor Compton um, doesn't have any either. So with that we are moving to the recommendations on page 147 um, and there are two there and if we can test Councillor Randall. Attachment two. So that's recommending the hearing panel's positions. Uh, sorry, provisions. And that all um, submissions all. on the variation be accepted. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm asking it be accepted. Yes, thank you. And are you happy to move um, B as well at the same time? Yeah, okay. So, so that's A and B moved by Councillor Randall, seconded by Councillor Pravanov. Is that yes? Thank you. So I'm going to open that up for debate. His Worship the Mayor. Sorry, sorry, um, Your Worship. I just in terms of being fair to everyone, Councillor Randall, right of introduction. No, I think you waive that right. Yeah, Thank you. Your Worship the Mayor. Sorry, I'm um, Guru. Right. Um, I support this simply because it's a reflection of a wider debate that needs to be held in terms of the NPS and the gravity of sort of centralised planning uh, versus uh, local communities shaping their local needs in terms of the places where they live. Yeah. I think this is a debate that's going to come and it's already happening in other parts of the country. Yeah. Um, we've got a number of local outcome plans. Um, in particular, I'd like to mention the Timana Road Garden Precinct. These places, this particular precinct was set aside precisely because there was fear that developers will cut up large sections of a highly valued garden area and the result we'll get is increased urbanization but by the same token we lose out on the high quality character so this is a debate that's going to start happening and so we should be aware um, that we need a fine balance between the need to meet uh, housing needs and also keeping our special character areas intact Thank you, Worship. Councillor McCann. Thank you. I will support <coughs> the variations based on what I see as um, the right thing for our community, given that so many other communities have had the ability to do the same thing. But it does strike me that we are now moving from a position where the public now need to take responsibility for the housing crisis that's there, and that if we each carve off our own section and say, not in my backyard, then we are not going to be part of the solution, we're actually part of the problem. So I think in fairness I have to support this community's wish because it, I think it is part of a previous process and that we will see some significant changes moving forward if we're actually to deal, in, deal with the housing crisis. Because while it might only be 400 houses or 400 properties, if just two of them could have had infill that is now going to be harder to take place because of uh, the new rules, then that's two families that may not have a home over their heads. Thanks, thanks Councillor McCann. And so um, likewise I'll be supporting um, the recommendations. I, I think what we've seen here today as well is the beauty of the portfolios working in terms of Councillor McCann um, holding the line around what's important to him around housing and so that is, uh, it's neat to see that stuff starting to show through um, in the portfolios. Um, also allowed the discussion to go on because it's important for our community 
um, uh, for those that are interested in this to see that we haven't just rubber stamped this, that there has been sort of robust discussion around this, questions asked and uh, positions taken around the different um, responses that we've had. So I've got no further questions up on the screen. I'm going to put that to the vote. Um, sorry, Councillor Randall, did you write a reply? Thank you. So I'm going to put that to the vote. Uh, all those in favour say aye. 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 Against. That is carried. So just give me a minute. I'm just going to check where we are on the agenda in terms of the next agenda item. Well, if everyone wants to do a little dance, you can in terms of the uh, variations. Look, that being said, um, uh, the Chief Executive just reminded me as an elected member I have, and I know others have fielded questions from the community around where we are with the proposed district plan and when it was going to be finalised because there uh, is a desire to get cracking um, and for certainty for their clients around building um, properties as well. Um, and so Councillor McCann, that's I guess another aspect of this is finalising the district plan and it becoming operative does give, does give certainty to the development community and that's certainly the feedback that I know Councillor Buswell has had as well from people and with this last one being um, signed off today um, that's a step in the right direction around that development so I'm um, sorry I uh, probably overlooked quite a momentous um, <laughs> occasion is it worthwhile just talking about those couple of steps, Jason, while you've got the opportunity, or would you rather just... OK. If by the time we've done landed this, then it's now time to start another review. No. It, it probably does have the feeling of, of painting the Harbour Bridge and getting to one end and, and starting uh, again once you've finished, but... Um, in all seriousness, yes, I, I do believe a, a fulsome conversation would be um, advantageous actually on the timing um, early next year. So we uh, propose really to work through this appeals period uh, and, and come back to uh, Council for a conversation about where we're at at that point. Uh, and so the appeals period will uh, end sometime in January and so um, shortly after that we'll know where we stand. Um, we, we are, since I've got the floor for a little moment, um, just looking at a couple of other things including national planning standards and, and the opportunities to deal with that central government requirement. So we're looking at that at the moment and working hard on that uh, behind the scenes. We'll know more about where we're at with that uh, at about the same time. So we'll be in a position to, to uh, have a chat with you about that. Um, yeah, and there are a few other little tidy up things that we'd like to do of a sort of more minor nature. So, uh, yeah, a further conversation uh, early next year would be really uh, good. Thanks very much, Jason and Matt, for your assistance today at the table. Um, so, team, we're going to move um, now on to item number 8.1 because Mark de Haast is able to join us uh, online. And so that is found on page six of your report. Thanks, Dean. Good morning, Mark. What's the weather like uh, down where you are? <laughs> good morning, Mr Chair, and good morning to everybody. Um, the weather is actually overcast down in Karori, and, and apologies for my, my lateness. Um, that was due to technical issues. Um, just by um, checking in, can you all hear me OK? That's a yes. All right, thank you. Mr Chair, through you, I'll, I'll just proceed. So um, the report that I'm speaking to now is the LGFA's statement of, te statement of intent for 2020-21. Um, um, I will take the report as read. Um, this paper is, is ready for noting because, um, as outlined in the paper, the statement of intent for the next three years, as far as LGFA are concerned, has actually already been approved. Um, as noted in the report, they, um, they certainly did provide a draft SOI by the 31st of March, but just with COVID-19, um, both with all the um, higher priorities within the council as well as within LGFA, um, we, didn't, we didn't bring it um, before you. But um, on balance, look, we're very, we're very happy with the statement of intent. Um, they've made some small changes to it um, following the draft that was issued in February, um, extremely sensible. Um, and as you can see in the report, um, they've made some 
made some revisions for some uncertainties following COVID-19. Um, in particular, they've increased um, forecast borrowing requirements for councils by $250 million. Um, that is a best estimate. And of course, that, that's um, also mindful that with a lot of councils um, that may have um, quite significant impacts on their revenue, um, that could also alter um, planned capital expenditure programs because the borrowings needed to, to do that as well as being able to refinance the interest has had has led to some changes in their forecasts. Their objectives, they've widened for the full well-beings and they've also quite sensibly, with interest rates being as low as they are and potentially going even lower, they've also, um, well, I guess, um, they've reduced the amount of investment that they, they anticipate from overseas borrowers and that has an impact of um, reducing their costs. So. Um, I will take the report as read, Mr Chair, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. And so, team, this is what I would refer to a business-as-usual sort of report, just for noting. Um, that being said, as always, you're welcome to ask any questions if you have. Um, there is also the appendices, which was attached, in a separate document around the statement of intent. So I can't see any names up on the screen. Just quick check around. If there's no questions, then I'll look for someone to move the recommendations on page right. 9 with Councillor Compton. Yes. Um, thank you, um, Wayne. Um, Your Worship, were you yeah. looking for a question? Yeah, I've got a question. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at uh, paragraph 12 of the report. Um, we, we get a savings of $147,000 from our involvement in this. Are there any other advantages of being in this apart from that $147,000? In the scheme, it doesn't yeah. seem a lot, but I'm sure there are other advantages of being in the scheme. Through you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, could, could, um, I, I couldn't quite hear the Mayor's question. Um, I think it relates to paragraph 12, the savings from LGFA, and I think the question is, are there any other advantages? But I didn't get the end of the question, sorry. Yeah, um, well, you actually did catch it. He said, what are the other benefits um, compared to just that small financial saving? And um, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd say, I would say um, the COVID crisis proved exactly what the benefit is of an aggregated borrowing vehicle for local government. Um, and the really, really big benefit was that local government bonds were being bought by the Reserve Bank at the same time as central government bonds. So the effect that that has had is to keep borrowing rates for local government low. If we were a single council doing our own borrowing on the open market, we would not have had that benefit. We do not have the scale where the Reserve Bank would be buying our bonds to keep interest rates low. So um, the benefit is unquantifiably large right this second, if you're a borrower right this second, through the last six months. And, and, and I kind of hesitate to say that it has been a fantastic piece of evidence um, of when things when the um, when the unpleasant material hits the air circulating device um, <laughs> um, that's when you really want to know that you've got something set up well because when things are going well it's harder to see the value I do think the last six months have absolutely proven why this vehicle was an inspired move if you like right now I hesitate to guess but I think our borrowing rates could, could have been heading very north and that would make um, council's ability to respond to increased capital programs for the benefit of the economy much, much harder. So it's also that lower interest rate, so it's not just the savings in terms of the lower interest rates and also access to funding as well. Yep, yep, both. So, so having access to actually be able to borrow the money in the in the market. So I'm um, Councillor Elliott. Oh, sorry, Your Worship. Second, second question, then Councillor Elliott. Second question is this. Given the shovel-ready projects and PGA projects being councils across the country have got money coming in. What impact has that got in terms of the ability to borrow and the business of the LGFA? Otherwise you'd be borrowing from them, right? We're just going to, um, if um, we can have the Chief exec Executive as interpreter again <laughs> with the um, connection. Happy to. We're figuring out what works, aren't we? So, um, so, so uh, not a lot of difference um, because the money that's generally coming in was for the most part for work that we no council was planning to do now. It helps with your debt headroom. If we had to do that without the government support, 
our, our, we would be far, far more limited in terms of expanding our capital programs. Uh, generally, they have encouraged us to either bring forward expenditure or to promote something completely new in the interests of the economy. They have been, um, I, as you know, not so supportive of us using their money to offset our existing work program. So um, our, um, our debt headroom, um, in my view, broadly stays the same. Our ability to do more without affecting that has been increased, so that's a positive. Um, and our cash flows have been improved because as of uh, this week, um, we've had confirmation, for example, that our Three Waters funding is approved and we're going to get 50% of it in November. So our cash flow is better because they're, they're front-loading um, their payments in many of these programs. Not all, but in many. Well, um, I can understand that side of it, but in terms of uh, a you know, business as normal, as usual, we'll be borrowing the money from the LGFA, and therefore and we are shareholders in that organisation. So this is less business for the LGFA because we are getting direct injection of funds right across the country, all the councils, from the government. Uh, again, they've asked us all to do extra work, not to offset something within our planned capital expenditure. So the exceptions to that are the likes of Auckland, who have had a $500 million hit in their revenues and therefore the ability to borrow has, has equally been constrained. So um, if they had said you can use our cash instead of having to do your own program of work, then you would be right. LGFA's revenues might have dropped. Um, I, would, I would argue their, um, their revenues are going to be, um, and you've heard it from Mark, um, they're forecasting a slight increase in the borrowing through them because councils are adding a little bit of their own impetus to the work programs. So, so I, I don't see it as a negative. I see it as actually not really changing the playing field at all. I guess if we think, Your Worship, um, use the Ōtaki Theatre as an example, we would have not looked to have borrowed that money for maybe another year or two where that's been brought forward. So that's actually increased the revenue for the LGFA. Um, you could argue that it won't be there in a couple of years' time, but we've, we all know what work, <laughs> the amount of earthquake-prone buildings around the country. Councillor Elliott, you've been waiting patiently. Um, thank you. Um, excuse me, Mr Chair. It's just a query, really. Um, the, the Mayor's question on... Um Question 12, paragraph 12, was on, up on page 48 and related to paper uh, 8.3, whereas um, I'm just uh, double-checking that we're actually considering paper 8.1, the, the intent, the statement of intent, at this current time on the agenda. We are, we are considering paper 8.1, correct. So if there's no Three. other questions, I'm just going to check with um, Councillor Compton. Sorry, did you have something to add, Mark? Through you, Mr Chair. I just wanted to um, add a comment there. Um, I guess just, just add a little bit more to what the Chief Executive said. So if, if we if we flip it on its head, um, so during COVID-19, as you know, we saw the LGFA being extremely extremely agile and they increased the interim, interim borrowing covenants um, for the next five years. So, um, if the committee is concerned, um, the sort of the uh, net debt to operating revenue covenants have been increased, which has created even more headroom, as the chief executive has said. And in terms of, um, I'd like to just assure the committee that in terms of, um, obviously, there's a joint and several liability for the total borrowings um, that is issued by the LGFA, but there is um, such a, a tight control mechanism in place, which we which we outline in our annual report, um, the chances of councils defaulting uh, are minimal. So um, obviously there's a risk if they're um, stimulating the economies of their areas and they're taking on more borrowings, obviously that combined debt's going to increase um, if it's not funded by the government. But there are such um, tight controls in place and, um, as I said, the risk of a council uh, defaulting is absolutely minimal. And the associated risk to the Kapiti Coast District Council is minimal as well. So, um, and that's something that we keep a very close eye on. Thank you, Mark. So, Councillor Compton, any questions from you before we move to the recommendations? No, shaking his head. Thank you. So, we've got the recommendations on page nine. Some good questions coming through. Is someone happy to move recommendation 26? Councillor Elliott, and seconded by Councillor Buswell. Right of introduction? Waved. So I'm going to open that up for debate. Any debate? 
There is none, so I'm going to put that to the vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. aye against. Carried. And so I'm just again going to double check which agenda item we're moving to because we did a reshuffle. And 8.3, the Chief Executive Assistant informed me. So that is found on page 47, team. And I think we have got Mark again, is it, that's speaking to that? And so, Mark, you're yeah. back on again. Item 8.3, team, on page 47. Thank you, Mr Chair. Through you, um, look, once again, um, a, a relatively straightforward report, so I will, I will take it as read. Um, this report is um, seeking the committee to, to note the, um, the 1920 annual report from the LGFA. Um, I, I'd like to just express we have, we have no concerns um, with the LGFA's performance. Um, and that this is a, um, to steal the, um, the chairman's words, this is a business as usual report that, that come, comes to the committee uh, as part of our uh, monitoring framework with our council control organisation. So I'm very happy to take questions uh, through you, Mr Chair. Thank you very much, Mark. Any questions from elected members? Yes, Councillor Elliott. Perhaps, Mark, um, you could just, I'm just referring to the table on page 48, where uh, the outcome to review uh, the participating local authorities' financial position was not met. Surely that's simply just a reporting process that would have been quite easy to meet? So through, through you, Mr Chair, uh, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> So, look, this, this, this was a very, this was a very, very minor breach, um, and not being able to review uh, participating local authorities' headrooms was really as a result of COVID nineteen. Um, some of the councils have actually, um, a, as part of a process. So, one, once we've all been through our annual reports, we we have to fill in a compliance documentation or the LGFA, where they sort of check that we meet all the covenants and, and controls. So um, so typically what they ask for is they ask for councils audited uh, financial results. So so not, not all the councils opted not to elect to the two-year extension. So um, we don't we don't normally see that. Um, it is a it is a monitoring process which has been impacted by by COVID nineteen and some delays. Thanks, Councillor Elliott. Good question. Would you then like to move the recommendation 30? Moved by Councillor Elliott. Looking for a seconder, His Worship the Mayor. Uh, right of introduction? Um, no, uh, waived. waived. Thank you very much for the Councillor Elliott's just noting your thanks to the staff for preparing the report. I'm going to um, open it up for debate. Um, and so, look, sorry, apologies. Um, Councillor Compton, I just um, skipped past checking with you, although I know we did chat offline and you had no concerns, but I just wanted to d double check. No, nope, he's happy. Um, and so, um, no debate. I'm going to put that to the vote. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. And that is carried. So now, team, we're just going to move on to the last um, agenda, the last um, report, sorry. As we're... Sh uh, sorry. Chief Executive is just leaving the table because he is uh, named in the report. And we are just having Sean come to the table to fill his shoes. And so, team, we're now on to item 8.2. Thanks very much, Wayne. Uh, 8.2 of the report, which is the um, annual general meeting, and obviously the chief executive is named in there as a name to be put forward for the vote. So, just in discussing it with Wayne, um, uh, he was already of the view that it was appropriate for him to step away from the table. So, Sean's now joined us. Um, and are you going to walk us through? Is it Mark? Mark's going to walk us through the. That's correct, yeah, Mark will put the key paper. Excellent. So look, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mark, and if you can walk us through this and then we'll move into questions. Thank you, Mr Chair, and, and through you. Um, yet again, this is, um, this is somewhat of a, um, a normal business-as-usual process. Um, the LGFA hold an annual general meeting uh, each and every year. 
And typically at, at that meeting, they, um, they ask for shareholders co to consider the annual report. Um, they have a process whereby they um, nominate and vote on um, change in the directors of the board. So in terms of the, um, the uh, constitution, um, two board members are up for, um, will come off the board every single year. And um, the shareholders council, there's um, participating local authorities um, uh, come off the board, uh, come off the shareholders council as well. So, obviously, um, our chief executive has left the room because this this year is a little bit different um, in the sense that the um, uh, our chief executive Wayne Maxwell has been put forward as a as a nomination to the board of directors of the LGFA. Um, as a as a as a, a non independent uh, member, um, by virtue of the fact that that Wayne is is employed in, in local government or is employed by by a participating local local authority shareholder. Um, just in terms of formalities, um, the the mayor was asked uh, very quickly um, to sign a, a document. Um, we had to, to nominate um, uh, Mr. Wayne Maxwell. Um, we had a formal process, uh, which is by way of a letter. Um, so so that, that was done um, under urgency. But um, for you, Mr. Chair, I believe the paper speaks for itself. I believe that um, through, with the council and through Wayne's leadership, um, certainly demonstrates the expertise and the skills uh, necessary to be on the board. Um, I just like to remind the committee that um, the financial strategy uh, received um, high endorsement from the officer of the Auditor General, and um, as we've reported to you before, um, our analysts that we've worked on from our independent credit rating agency, Standard and Paws, we've worked with him for several years, and he's pretty tough. I can tell you that. Um, he said to us, "Never ever has he ever seen a council go up two notches in terms of the credit rating upgrade." So. Um, so today we are seeking your support as to uh, what what you would like to vote on at the AGM. There's um, there's a number of of ways we can do this. Um, the intention is for myself to attend the AGM <coughs> and vote on the committee's behalf uh, as per the recommendations. Um, <coughs> or alternatively, you can provide a proxy vote. But um, the general thrust of the um, of the paper is um, seeking uh, your approval to vote as we recommend. Um, in the report, we have outlined that we feel, generally speaking, the shareholders' council um, is 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 quite heavily weighted in terms of, of councils um, that are geographically speaking are um, are sort of mid to upper North Island. And um, it has been a concern that we've raised for a wee while that we wanted a bit more balanced uh, representation uh, at the shareholders council across the whole of New Zealand. So our recommendations are for um, for a stronger representation on the South Island. And I think probably, Mr Chair, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll take some questions and I'm happy to take you through the recommendations one by one if the committee wishes. Thank you, Mark. And I was going to um, ask if you could, just for clarity, and um, we, you know, we do have some new elected members around the table as well, so I'd like um, them to be comfortable that they are clear on what they're voting on. Um, could I just uh, clarify uh, for the benefit of the table that even by voting for the Chief Executive, if that's the will of the table, that doesn't guarantee that he will have a position on the table. Do you want to maybe just talk for a minute around that process from there? Yeah, absolutely. Through you, Mr Chair, absolutely. So, um, look, look, absolutely correct. Um, so, essentially what this paper is doing is it's providing, it's providing me with what I am voting for on, on behalf of, of the Council. Um, at the AGM, um, everyone, um, so typically it's, it's attended, the, the full Board of Directors will be there. Um, and typically we have shareholder representatives from about 20 to 30 local authorities. Now, um, when we get to voting, um, uh, all, all, all um, representatives have an equal vote. So it literally goes to, to the vote. So the, um, 
the chairman of the board will, will stand up at the podium and he puts the matter forward and um, it's a very it's a very rapid fire process um, it's uh, all those in favor uh, please raise your hands uh, all your all those against raise your hands and the vote is either won or lost so um, so uh, yeah absolutely mr chair uh, through you mr chair um, by by providing me with the votes doesn't guarantee that's going to be the outcome because there are other voters in the room. Thank you, Mark. And um, look, I don't want to sort of bore elected members to death, but I do think there's probably benefit in just moving through the recommend. If Mark could just talk us through the recommend, I can see some nods. So obviously some of them are quite straightforward, but you can um, move through the more simpler ones pretty quickly, Mark. But if you want to just go through the recommendations and then I'll open up for questions. Um. <coughs> Sorry, you're, on, you're on now, Mark. Just if you could run through the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so recommendation 2A is effectively um, authorising myself to vote on behalf of the council. Um, given that the chief executive is um, is actually standing for a, a board position, it's, it's inappropriate that he's voting. So number A is um, providing me with the authority to vote on the council's behalf, and um, it's recommendation B, um, AA, BB, CC, DD, and EE that I'll be actually voting on. So that that's the order of the votes. Um, so um, if you if you don't uh, want me to vote on behalf of the council, um, effectively what recommendation fifty two B is saying is that we'll activate our proxy vote which means that we'll authorise the Chief Executive of the Local Government Funding Agency, Mark Butcher, to vote on our behalf. Um, so, so I think there's a decision there, um, Mr Chair, whether or not the Committee or Council are uh, comfortable for me to vote on the Council's behalf or whether you'd like to do it by, by a proxy vote, which is done by the Chief Executive of the LGFA. Um, that's the first part. The second part is we want to clarify how you would like us to vote. Um, what we've bold is, is, is our recommendation. So the first, the first decision, uh, or the first, the first, the first item to vote for, would be to elect uh, Wayne Maxwell as a non-independent director of the LGFA board. Um, our recommendation is four. The second, um, the second matter is a um, a current director of, of the board as standing for re-election, um, and that is Mr. Philip Corey Wright. He is an independent director. Um, we are very satisfied with his performance, and so we are recommending to vote uh, in favour of re-electing Mr. Philip Corey Wright. The third item that we'll be voting on is our recommendation is to um, elect New Plymouth District Council to the Shareholders Council, we are, um, we are then uh, recommending that we re-elect Tasman District Council uh, onto the Shareholders Council. Now that is to, to, to um, strengthen the representation on the Shareholders Council of both North and South Island. And then there's some just minor changes to the LGFA, LGFA founding policies, um, which, which, which we support. Um, in fact, we have to do that. So um, he's really a, 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 a no-brainer. Thank you, Mark. Could I just clarify, um, with the um, A and B, um, so 52 A and B, uh, the way that I read that was that we would be voting for both of them, not either or. Um, that B was uh, uh, in the um, instance where you were unable to attend, then Mark would be uh, authorised uh, for Council's proxy vote. And I was just checking with Sean, and I think he thought the same. Um, what I heard you say was that we either vote for A or B. Oh, through you, Mr. Chair. Look, um, look, absolutely. Um, that that's entirely in, entirely sensible um, to do both of them in the event that I'm that I'm unable to attend. Um, equally, if you don't want me to vote on the council's behalf, we can go straight to proxy. So um, both are correct. Uh, thank you. That that's helpful clarification. Councillor McCann, have we got a question from you? I do. I've got a number of questions through you, Mr Chair. Uh, the first one, uh, and just to understand the process, why was there urgency um, in relation to the nomination? 
what was the process? Uh, is that normal process? Because I don't quite understand. Through, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, look, put quite simply, um, is that it's actually quite a quite a significant thing to put yourself up to nominate to put yourself in contention for going onto the on, onto the board um, for the LGFA and. Um, the, 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 the paperwork is, is not onerous, um, but it's not always clear what the process is. But um, the, sim the simple fact was that um, Wayne Maxwell um, has been considering um, uh, putting himself up for nomination for a wee while, but with COVID-19 and, and all the pressures on the organisation, um, it took, took some time and, and really decided last minute that he, he would actually put his hand up for nomination. Are you actually saying that Wayne Maxwell didn't know his own mind? Is that what you're telling us? No, no, I'm, no, I'm no, certainly not. the question because it wasn't serious. Um, but uh, can you tell us what the obligations and commitments are for our CE? Because obviously there must be some and that must take them away from our council business. Through you, Mr Chair. So, um, Look, to the best of my knowledge, in terms of the commitments, um, how frequently does the board the board meet? So um, through, through, through my knowledge, they will meet uh, approximately four times a year. Um, in terms of the structure with the LGFA, you have, a, you have the, obviously you have the board, and then beneath that you have the shareholders' council. Now, the, the commitment to the shareholders' council is far wider. Um, the shareholder council uh, does, does a quite a monitor, you know, has quite an extensive uh, extensive monitoring role, um, but in terms of um, the chief executive's commitments um, to to the board, they meet approximately four times a year, um, and more if, if required. And um, having the conversation with the chief executive doesn't he doesn't see he does it you know feels quite strongly that um, his. his um, the commitment that's required to be an effective director won't dilute his commitment to the council at all. So it's a, it's perfectly manageable. Thank you. And one final question, just because members of the community will ask us, is there enumeration attached to this position? Yes. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, um, yes, um, there, is, there is remuneration a, a, attached to this position. Um, the remuneration is, is publicly um, recorded by way of, of, of the um, annual report. Thank you. No further questions. Councillor Buswell. Thank you. A couple of my concerns were already raised with um, what Councillor McCann has brought up, and, and that was the timing around how much commitment um, Mr Maxwood would have to give to it. And, and I guess the side effects would be that he's not, in our operation, pushing forward with Kapiti Coast District Council projects, which we all know is, um, you know, we've got a huge work plan ahead of us. And um, my concern is not so much around his capacity to be able to to, to do that job and um, in his skill level, absolutely get it, understand that he would be able to do it. But my concern is the level of commitment and what does he drop to do this job. Um, so in a roundabout way, really, what's in it for the Kapiti Coast District Council if he does stand and get elected? But through, through you, Mr. Chair, um, look, there's a couple of things there. Um, there there's probably a three, I think there's a two or three questions in there. So, so f first of all, the, um, the, the incumbent non-independent director, Mr. Mike Timmer, is, um, is actually a, a tier three member of staff of Greater Wellington Regional Council. And, um, he's got a very large portfolio and has been able to, um, you know, um, fulfil his, his um, day job 100% as well as that of, of what he does on the board. So um, in, terms of, in terms of Mr Wayne Maxwell, um, the discussions that we've had is that um, his attendance at, at board meetings is going to be done by way of annual leave. And um, obviously with technology, um, the LGFA are no different to everybody else. They've embraced, embraced technology and their meetings can be a combination of in-person in meetings as well as um, by Zoom. 
So, um, so, so we've got no concerns about Mr. Maxwell um, not being able to commit fully to the to the business of the council. Um, for Mr. Maxwell, uh, first and foremost, is is the business of the Kapiti Coast District Council. Um, what's in it for? Um, what is what is in it for the Kapiti Coast District Council to have Mr. Wayne Maxwell on the board of the LGFA? Um, I think quite quite simply, um, it puts us at, at a position of strength. Um, the shareholders council have indicated to us that next year they will be rolling out a little program of work that will review the competencies of the board members as well as the duration that board members serve on the board. Um, as you've seen in the appendix, there's been a number of them that have been there for some time. Um, COVID-19 has brought about a lot of fresh thinking. Um, the advantage to, to our council to have Mr Maxwell on the board is that his finger's very much on the pulse. Um, he's very connected to yourselves, very connected to our community and can help reshape um, the future direction of the LGFA. He also has extensive tre treasury um, knowledge, but he also knows what works most for the shareholder. Um, I think we, we heard him this morning on report 8.1 just showing how, you know, telling us how successful the LGFA has been and during COVID-19 how, how imperative it is for us to have guaranteed access to cash but also access to, to, to low cost debt. So to have, to have someone that is actively working in local government at the level of a chief executive will be hugely beneficial to, to us but also the whole local government sector. Thank you. Councillor Elliott. Thank you. Good, good questions, um, Councillor Buswell. It's important to know that as well. Um, but I am curious to know, um, Mr De Haas, are you available on the 19th of November to attend this meeting on behalf of Council? Through you, through you, Mr Chair. Um, absolutely, I am available to attend the AGM. OK, thank you. Um, there being no more questions, or when there are no more questions, um, I am happy to move this. OK, to move recommendation in part, the first part. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to you in a second, Councillor Elliott. I've got Councillor McCann and then I'm going to count, check in with Councillor Compton and then I can see Councillor Pravanov's names up there as well. So, Councillor McCann. Through you, Mr Chair, just one final um, question. This position, uh, if Wayne were to um, move from his position as CE here, that doesn't affect his role as a um, representative or does it? Through, <coughs> through you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, uh, look, look. There's, there's certainly no, there's certainly no com conflict of interest, and there's certainly no legislation that, if if, if Mr. Maxwell were to be appointed to the board, um, there's no conflict of interest, and it wouldn't mean that he'd have to step down as chief executive. Um, his appointment is for uh, a non-independent member to the board. Mark, I think the question, and that's helpful, but I think it was more around if he moved on from his role here as chief, of, chief executive, say, to another council or to another organisation, would he continue in his role on the LGFA if he was uh, elected? Uh, through, through you, Mr Chair. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I completely missed the gist of the question there. My apologies. Um, no, look, um, if, um, if Mr Maxwell uh, moved on from the Kapiti Coast District Council, he would still retain his board position if he were appointed to the board. For three years, oh, sorry, for one year. It's a it's a one year at the moment. It's a one year. Um, Non-independent directors uh, must put themselves up for re-election every twelve months. Thank you, Mark. I've got Councillor Pravanov, and then it looks like we'll be moving to the recommendations, which I do want to check with elected members first around how we take them. So, Councillor Pravanov. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. So, good questions around. Um, um, Mr Maxwell um, in relation to this board. So I, I see there's also a number of, of other um, points that we're going to be voting on um, which relate to um, Philip Corrie White and electing the New Plymouth District Council person and Tasman District Council. Is there any reason why they are also included in this and whether you can provide any more details around those two people, please? So I'm not too sure if you just heard that clearly, um, Mark, but it was just around the other 
um, members that were recommended in the recommendations um, and the other councils, although I do believe it was covered off in the body of the report. Um, so for example, having representation from the South Island was important, but I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, through you, Mr Chair. Um, so with regards to recommendation 50B, um, double B, um, the, the Philip Corey writes, um, <clears throat> so um, as I mentioned earlier, so he, he, he's, he's currently uh, serving on the LGFA Board of Directors as an independent member. Uh, he has done so for many years. The, um, he has, he has um, put himself um, forward for re-election the um, the officers have, have no 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 um, no concerns uh, regarding um, his his performance, and so we support him being re-elected. So um, put you know put simplistically, he's currently on the board. He's doing a good job, and he's put his hand up to be re-elected as a as an independent, and we we do support that. Um, we did not receive, uh, apart from um, Mr. Wayne Maxwell, there were no nominations for alternate directors um, for for the for or alternate independent directors. So, so that's why um, we we are recommending to to reappoint uh, Mr. Philip Corey Wright. In terms of the shareholders council, um, you need to put as a nominating local authority, you need to put your hand up if you want to go on to the shareholders council. Um, New Plymouth District Council has put their hands up. Um, we we believe that the shareholders council is doing a fantastic job, but um, the shareholders council has been quite consistent for a number of years. So we we believe at this stage with COVID nineteen. It's a good time to actually change things up a little bit. So we're actually um, asking you to support some fresh blood coming into the Shareholders Council by the way of, of New Plymouth. And then um, recommendation double T in terms of re-electing the Tasman District Council. Um, again, we, we would, we would uh, really prefer to have a lot of new councils putting their hands up. But given that Tasman District Council represents the South Island and we would like to see stronger representation on the South Island, we're recommending that you support the re-election of Tasman District Council to the Shareholders Council. Thank you, Mark. That was pretty clear. Councillor Pravanov, did you have any further questions? So um, just in relation to CC and DD, so it's also with the chief executives of those two councils, would it? Through you, Mr. Chair, I didn't get the what was the question. What's the particular relevance of those two councils? So it would also be the chief executive of those of those two councils. Um, so, so she, the shareholder councils. Um, so the shareholders council is made up of nominating local authorities. So it's 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 typically a representative from those councils. So very rarely is it the chief executive. It's um, either your treasury manager, your risk manager or your group manager corporate services. It's someone who's actively involved in the treasury management function, which is actually quite rare that a chief executive is. So we're very fortunate that Mr. Maxwell is. Um, but no, um, we, are, we are actually, what we're voting for is we're voting for New Plymouth District Council to be represented on the shareholder council. Um, and, and they will appoint an officer that they feel um, is able to do, to do the role properly and likewise for Tasman District Council. So just to be clear, we're not voting for the chief executive of those councils to be on the shareholder council. What we are actually voting for is the representation on the shareholders council, which will be done at an officer level. Thank you, Mark. Councillor Halliday. Uh, just a curiosity, uh, but we've talked about the time factor that might be involved in Mr. Maxwell's, Mr. Maxwell's appointment and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, are there any other boards that Mr. Maxwell is on currently that uh, are of a similar sort of nature um, that are also um, part of potentially uh, taking his time away from KCDC at all? Through you, Mr. Chair, not that I'm aware of. Um, just. Just having a little bit of time to process, um, just going back to the, the, the earlier question from Councillor Buswell, you know, what benefits will will our council get? Um, I'm certainly not aware that Mr Maxwell is in, on any other uh, boards. 
Um, the, the benefit that we'll also get from Mr. Maxwell being on there is um, that board is, um, is made up of, of um, uh, experts in the field. So from um, the, the networking and the access and the exposure that Ms. Mr. Maxwell will get to financial experts will be fundamental and very beneficial for, for our council. But no, the answer to your question is I'm not aware that Mr. Maxwell sits on any other major boards. Thank you, Mark. I think I saw Councillor Hanford's name pop up and then it's gone away again. I'm just double checking. Oh, yeah, I was just thinking it wasn't already in the report before I just confirming that it wasn't already in here. But I'm wondering, I'm just wondering whether we know how many other nominees have have been put forward for each of these different roles and, and for the, um, yeah, in terms of the, also thinking about the, um, the Shareholders Council as well. So for members of the board, but also the Shareholders Council and how many of those have to be independent and how many of them, because looking on the website now, it looks like there are lots of independent directors and there's a director and so kind of the makeup of the the board as well. Yeah, um, through you, Mr Chair, look, really good question. Look, to the best of my knowledge, I think in terms of the, the makeup of the board of directors, I think there's five that must be independent and up to two can be um, non-independent. Um, at the moment, they only have one non-independent. Um, the, uh, they're certainly not looking for two non-independents. Non in terms of the board of directors, um, so in terms of the process, we, we get notified of the intended date for the AGM and all shareholders get asked to put forward nominations, whether it's for the shareholders council or for the uh, board of directors. In terms of the Board of Directors, except for Mr. Main Wax Maxwell, there were no new nominations that were put forward for the following year. Um, and as I said earlier, um, the non-independent directors must must rotate every year. Um, now, Mike Timmer is the current non-independent director, so he has put himself up for uh, re-election. And without any new nominations, it's automatically grant granted. So... Mr. Main, Wayne Maxwell is, um, well, hopefully we'll get your support today to, to vote for him as he has put his hand up for a um, non-independent director role. In terms of the shareholder council, uh, what, what typically happens is they must rotate after every three years. What typically happens is the shareholder council participants put themselves up for re-election and um, this year, only New Plymouth has um, has come into the mix and put themselves up as new participants into the Shareholders Council. So very short answer to your question is um, only two new entries were received this year. Okay, thank you very much. And um, Councillor Compton, I think I saw the box pop up before where you had no further questions. So unless I see that pop up again, I'm going to look to Councillor Elliott. And before you... Um, get on the mic, could I suggest but it's entirely your call as the mover that you move the recommendations if you agree with them as a whole rather than going through independently um, sorry, individually um, if you agree with all of those you may not agree with one of them in which point you could move up until that point and then take one separately um, so I'll look to you in terms of how you want to as the mover move them, obviously you have the right if you want to go by one by one we'll just be here a little bit longer Mr Chair, I would like to suggest perhaps that moving 50B in order that we establish how the table is feeling about those parts AA to EE and whether or not I have, we have consensus around the table. I think we need to move from the start down in terms of receives and noting the report. So um, I, I guess to stay within the formalities of the meeting, do we have any objections to the recommendations being moved as a whole um, to give Councillor Elliott a steer? His Worship, the Mayor, wants a clarification. My understanding is that uh, A and B are mutually okay because in case um, Mark cannot make it, then we have by proxy. That's what we clarified. I think the point Councillor Elliott was making was just around whether there was any issue with um, elected members ha um, having Mr De Haast um, as the representative. I don't think there would be, but can't assume that. So, team, again, we 
I think Councillor Elliott, sorry, in responding to your request, it's better that we rather than go part way down and then jump back up again, I think you need to go to that it receives. We can go through individually, one by one, if you want to. Um, the worst happens is that you take them as a whole and it, it loses at the vote. So, okay, I would like to um, move all the recommendations, uh, recommendation 50. Thank you, in all parts. Thank you. So that's 50, 1 and 2. A and B, and then AA, BB, CC, DD, and EE, uh, and the fours uh, in the AA through to EE. Councillor seconded. Councillor McCann has seconded. Right of introduction, Councillor Elliott. So, sorry, just before I do that, I'm looking at everyone is aware where we're at. We've had the recommendations moved. Right of introduction from Councillor Elliott. Compton. Uh, Councillor Compton, in terms of the. Uh, what was your question, Councillor Elliott? Was uh, in terms of the voting order, is, is this a, um, approval by Councillor Compton? Yes. yes. Okay. Lovely. Um, I would like to thank staff for this rather comprehensive set of um, reports today, and also uh, thank um, Mark on behalf of the table for carrying out this uh, role for us. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Um, it's open now for debate. Any discussion through debate? His Worship the Mayor. Um, I think one of the strong points when we appointed um, Maxwell as Chief Executive has been his particular set of financial skills that he's brought. We had known this in previous trainings before when he was Chief Financial Officer. And given the uncertainties we are looking at in the global economy and the global financial markets, it will be very useful to have somebody of, uh, from our side of the fence, so to speak, to be sitting around the board um, of the LGFA, um, able to tap into a whole range of information because they will be dealing with financial issues both globally and nationally. So it is useful for us to have from our side, representing not just Earth but the sector, um, sitting in that um, area. Um, uh, so this is this is good, and I hope that um, push comes to shove when the voting happens, uh, we actually get him in. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't see any other names on the screen, so I'm going to put that to the um, vote. Um, and sorry, I just checked Councillor Compton hasn't put his hand up for anything through debate. Um, so all those in favour uh, for the recommendations as per the report? Uh, aye. Aye. Those against? And that was carried unanimously. Thank you, team. Just moving back on the digital report to the agenda. And so we're now moving on to page 148. I'm just checking, so we've, um, we've gone through 8.1, 8.2, 3 and 4, that's correct. And so we're now moving on to page 148, confirmation of minutes. Doing well this morning, team. Thank you very much. And if there's nothing arising from the minutes, would someone like to move the minutes as being a true and accurate record? I just wanted to check, it's just a typo, but um, I don't know how relevant it is to raise it. Um, but on page 150, Councillor, I think, uh, Hollow Borrow? <laughs> Not too sure how. <laughs> thank you. Councillor Randall, were you hoping to, um, to thank you? Councillor Randall was uh, is happy to move the minutes. Um, Councillor Hanford is seconding them. Uh, right of introduction, I'm assuming there is none. Thank you, Bernie. Um, open that up for debate. Is none. All those in favour say aye. aye. Aye against, and that is carried. And so, I think, sorry, it always takes a few seconds to scroll right back up at the top on the big agendas. And so there is no one here for public speaking time and we have no confirmation of publicly excluded minutes. So I'm going to call the meeting to an end. So look, that was good team. Thank you very much for your participation and thanks for staff for their assistance. Um, call it a day. Thank you.